Good. Well, welcome, everybody. Welcome to this evening lecture on uh, circular economy uh, manufacturing. Um, this is actually the fourth in a series of, of five lectures that we've got. Um, and this one particularly is covering reverse logistics, um, material and component reuse, and also the role of digital technologies. Um, my name is Louise McGregor from Zero Waste Scotland, and I'm really delighted to introduce you all to the session. I'm just here really to give you a, a short introduction before I hand over to Moran, who's our speaker um, this evening. Um, and after Moran has spoken, there's an opportunity for questions as well. So we're going to have a little bit of a panel. Um, and uh, Mark Hilton from Unomia Consulting, who's helped us pull together the uh, masterclasses and the lecture series, um, will be joining us on that. So there'll be three of us to, to quiz, if, if you so wish. So before we start, really, just wanted to give you um, a, just a quick um, overview of Zero Waste Scotland, the organisation that I work for. For those of you who haven't heard of us, um, we are funded by the Scottish Government really to support their circular economy strategy and really to help Scotland use resources more wisely um, with the kind of the resulting benefits that that brings. And you can see the mission statement there on the screen. Um, we currently also, as well as the core funding from the Scottish Government, have European Regional Development Funding, which is allowing us to accelerate and, and fund bu more businesses to do more. And that's um, what we're doing over the next couple of years to support <coughs> businesses to identify and implement circular economy opportunities. So we're currently providing support to around 43 businesses at the moment and through our circular economy business service. And we're also providing some grant support to further businesses to the tune of about 4.2 million at the moment, but that through our circular economy investment fund and that fund remains open to the end of um, December 2019. So we would really encourage you to um, spread the word a little bit about manufacturing and the circular economy. Mm -hmm. So if there's things that strike you as interesting, please do tweet about it tonight. We're, we're keen to let others know about um, you know, the talk that we hear tonight. So um, just encourage you to do that and use that hashtag, make things last, um, to join the conversation. So I thought it would be just helpful um, just to set us off really just to think about what the circular economy is. To some of you, it's probably a new concept. To others, you've heard of it um, already. But essentially, it's an all-encompassing all approach to how we design, use, and consume products and services um, across the whole economy. Um, and it's really about trying to retain value in those products and services for as long as possible to maximize the value of those things. Um, so instead of kind of purchasing, using, and then just disposing of products, which is the kind of the linear model, um, we sort of use, we purchase and use the products, but then they're designed with that, the whole life cycle in, in mind. So at the end of their first life, um, somebody's already thought about what happens to them next, whether they're repa repaired, remanufactured, or whether they last a long time. So it's, it's thinking about that at the very start of the design stage of either products or, or services and there's we've got a little kind of loop there which kind of demonstrates that and I think Moran will be giving us a, a few examples of what that means practically um, shortly so in a manufacturing context what's what's the reason why we're focusing on manufacturing and the reason for these the lecture series that that we've got and I suppose really it's about the opportunity for manufacturing there is um, really a globally recognised opportunity um, and it is, the circular economy is quite a compelling framework for 21st century manufacturing. Um, it's manufacturing central to a well-functioning circular economy and um, I heard a lecture a couple of years ago that approximately 10% of the materials used by manufacturing is all that actually ends up in final products. So there's a huge issue there of resource and material utilisation. And we've got to get smarter and better at using our materials more wisely, particularly as they become less, less available to us. Um, and actually manufacturers then can think about designing sort of business services and products and getting those products to market and to customers in a whole variety of different ways that helps them to retain the value in that and that could be a whole range of different things like different leasing models incentivized return kind of systems to make sure they can retain that value themselves 
And that brings quite a number of benefits. So the forward-looking companies that are already doing this can see that actually it can provide better um, relationships with customers. Um, it also provides um, improved resilience. It can provide better profitability as well. So there's a whole range of economic reasons why this is a good idea. Um, we've done a little bit of work in Scotland around the manufacturing sector manufacturing sector and manufacturing industries and we reckon roughly there's the savings of about up to 1.5 billion just in Scotland from implementing more circular processes and, and models um, and that's you know five to nine percent of, of the turnover for those particular subsectors so it's not insignificant um, and could make quite a difference in Scotland um, if we could actually implement some of these models. So the other reason really that we're quite keen that we talk to manufacturing is, is the emphasis um, within two strategy documents and two policy documents of the Scottish Government. Um, both of these were issued two years ago, um, February 2016. The first is the Making thing, Things Last strategy, which is the circular economy strategy, which was issued through the waste team, but is very much a cross-government policy document and sets out the government's vision really for how we um, move towards a more circular economy in Scotland. Um, the second is a manufacturing future for Scotland um, which is the manufacturing action plan um, and actually encompasses circular economy thinking within that. There's eight work streams within that um, programme of work, um, one of them being the circular economy. So it's recognised as important across the economy. It's also mentioned in um, Scotland's economic strategy as well. So it's a kind of cross-government. The government has recognised the benefits and has um, recognised that in, in these policy documents. So it's an important area for us. So just to say a little bit about the um, lectures, obviously I've mentioned this is the fourth of five lectures, um, and they're really all designed to really showcase experts from manufacturing who are really already at the cutting edge and already implementing circular models um, in their kind of business um, or their organisation. And really the intention is that they'll provide us some, some insights into what's possible and, and give us some ideas. So tonight, um, we're delighted to, to, to welcome um, Morin. Um, and um, Morin, actually, for those of you who are um, uh, observant within the, um, within the audience, you'll know that it should have been Irene who was here. But I think there's been some changes within DHL, so uh, Morin's joined us instead. Um, and then next week we have a final lecture, which I think is March the 14th, um, where the Nokia designer Tapani Jokin, Jokin is joining us um, to talk about um, design and mobiles in particular. Um, the ultimate plan also is to follow the lecture series, the series of masterclasses, which um, we're anticipating will happen sort of autumn this, this year. And they'll provide some more in-depth practical um, uh, workshops really, um, full day workshops around the circular economy and they'll be de delivered by leading circular economy practitioners. So if you are interested in coming to one of those as well we'd encourage you to kind of register your interest on our website. So without further ado let me introduce Morin Broyle um, properly and hand over to him. It's a great pleasure to introduce him. Um, he's a senior expert in the corporate um, shared value Go Green division of Deutsche Post um, DHL. And I understand your responsibilities include, Morin, um, translation of the circular economy concept into actual practical um, business, tangible business um, propositions and business cases within Deutsche Post DHL. And also leading strategic initiatives, um, particularly around kind of um, reverse logistics, etc. So, without further ado, I'll pass over to you, Moran, and then we look forward to um, hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you. Good. 
Thank you very much, Luis, for this very kind introduction. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Maureen. As you said, um, I work in the Shared Value Go Green department of DPDHL in Bonn. Uh, thank you very much, Luis and Zero Waste Scotland, for inviting DPDHL and giving me the opportunity to discuss with you the topic of circular economy and how it changes logistics. It truly is an honor to be here um, and see so many people interested in circular and in what we do as a company around it. I'm sure most of you have come across this red and yellow logo here um, and have used DHL services in the past. We are a group of four divisions. Each of these divisions is active in a certain area of logistics. So for example, if you look here, or an airplane, um, this represents DHL Express. So if you want to send something urgent to somewhere around the world, you use probably DHL Express. If you want to ship a batch of products, let's say from China to Scotland, my forwarding colleagues from DGFF will probably happily offer you a container transport for it. And if you aim at optimizing your supply chain, talk to supply chain of um, DSC. And if you want to expand your e-commerce offer or to use postal services in Germany, but also <coughs> in Europe, talk to my PEP colleagues. All these services are mainly known with respect to forward logistics, and this is important. But what I want to do to talk to you about today is our engagement in reverse logistics in a circular economy. As the leading logistics company, we aim at enabling a circular economy internally within DHL, but also for our customers. And this goes way beyond regular returns of packages, what we do already today. It's about rethinking and restructuring of the way we do business. Speaking of structuring, here's what I will talk to you about today. Um, first, I will give you a brief introduction into the strategic positioning of Circular within our company. Then I will talk about our understanding of the concept and the involvement of the circular logistics project within DHL until today. And then finally, a number of use cases will make it hopefully a bit more concrete and tangible. They will be actually more than three. As a global company, it is highly important for us to have a positive impact and to make a difference. That's why four years ago, we introduced our new strategy 2020. We call it Focus, Connect, Grow. And it belong, there are three pillars which are relevant for today. So first of all, the focus pillar. This describes that we are committed to the needs of our stakeholders, and this is important, and our planet. We connect across our, our organization and we expand in new market segments. What is important about it today is that it fits, circularity fits perfectly in our corporate strategy. It is deeply rooted in our strategy, is our belief that the needs and benefits of the society and environment are the drivers for our own success. Without it, it won't work. That's why our company's purpose is to connect people and improve their lives. We do this in over 220 countries and territories around the world. We aim at bringing this purpose to life through four approaches. The first one is RBP, Responsible Business Practice. This is the way how we want to do business. We want to become the benchmark for responsible business. We are committed to the strict adherence of applicable law, ethical standards, and international norms in everything we do. The second one, corporate citizenship. As a multinational company, we have a strong corporate social responsibility pillar. This is on the one hand our Go Help program. This is a strategic disaster management program. For example, when you have an, air, an earthquake somewhere around the world, we help. And on the other hand, the Go Teach program, our educational program. But then to come to the two central approaches for today's presentation. First of all, there's Go Green. This is our environmental program, protection program. As the world's largest log logistics service provider, we have a special obligation to minimize the negative impact of our business on the environment. <coughs> and then, even more important, the shared value part. This is really the focus of today. 
Has anyone in the room heard about shared value before? Does it make sense to you? Has anyone, anyone heard about shared value? Yeah? Okay. So it's a concept we borrowed from uh, the economist uh, Michael Porter, you probably know him, and Mark Kramer. What does it mean? Uh, traditionally in a business context, success was only measured only by financial value creation. So the, the more money you make, the more successful you are. And we all know that this leads to social, environmental, and economic problems. More and more companies try to bring business and society back together. And I think this is important. And this is, they call it shared value. It means generating economic value, yes, this is important, in a way that also produces value for society. So that they are not contradictory anymore, but they work together. together. But before we go into detail about shared value and circular, I also want to give you some insights into the environmental program or dimension. For us, the environmental topic is extraordinarily important, but also complex at the same time. We are a logistics company. We have planes in the air, trucks on the road, and ships on the oceans literally at all times. And we ship physical products from A to B. And this is all related to emissions. Already back in the early 2000s, we recognized that we have to change. That's why in 2008, we, um, we were the first logistics company with a quantified carbon efficiency target. And now again, last year, our corporate board communicated our new strategy. By 2050, we want to reduce all logistics-related emissions to zero. This is the tag here. Um, by this, we are setting a new standard, we believe, for the future of the transport sector. And we are actually the first logistics company in the world to set such an ambitious target. And by this, we want to help the, the world community fighting global warming. Having said that, we not only want to become green, but uh, as I've already touched upon, we aim at generating economic success by creating social and env environmental value through shared value. And we are delivering this shared value through our global network. To give you an example, my colleague Nick is driving an, a humanitarian logistics project, that's how we call it. The goal of it is to improve vaccination around the world in remote areas of the world. And for this, we are using our health sector capabilities. You all know that vaccines, for example, are temperature sensitive. So that's why we use our global thermonet network. We have more than 100 million kilograms of temperature sensitive medical goods that we ship each year in this network. Or we also use our global warehousing network. We have more than 160 life science graded warehouses globally. And we want to make the shared value approach natural to all our employees and disseminate the shared value concept in the company. And then circular is another example of shared value. How has circular logistics project evolved until today? Our starting point was an increase in customer demand for reverse logistics projects or products. For example, when you look into the tech sector segment, we were approached for recall services of used electronic devices. And this was a, really a growth opportunity for us, delivering shared value proposition beyond green. I will give you some more examples in the use case part. The second step was the definition of our role. First of all, we had to understand the concept. We had to develop a strategic approach. For this, we ran a, a series of workshops together with our customers to understand their needs. And we started disseminating, as already said, disseminating the knowledge throughout the group. And now, where we are now is that we are developing concrete circular solutions and work on BCAs for our customers to set new industry standards from a product perspective. As a leader in logistics, we want to become also the leader in circular logistics. As you will see later within DHL, we already today have many examples of circular use cases around the world. And we are at the same time fully committed to, to take the next step, 
forward and develop more reverse solutions for our customers as we consider it to really be an integral part of the path towards a circular economy. So, but before we have a deeper look into the examples, what does circularity actually mean for our business in general and for the logistics industry in particular? You have already ex explained the basic concept. Although academics, thought leaders and select businesses uh, already started to discuss the concept in the 1970s, for us as a company this concept is still somewhat new. It is actually a new way of doing business. It is an answer to the manifesting limits of the traditional linear take, make, dispose economy. In a linear economy, manufacturers typically, typically take resources out of the ground, make, make a product out of them, and then at, at the end of the use cycle, they just get discarded in landfills. And this has obvious negative impact on the environment. I think we don't need to discuss this point. But there's not only the environmental um, aspect. There are also great swings in the resource costs and supply chain disruptions. And these actually expose companies at risks. Plus, they can't extract the embedded costs in the product and the costs of the labor and the materials at the end of the life cycle. This means that companies have more and more increasing interest of getting their products back at the end of their life cycle. In a circular economy, products need to be designed with already disassembly and reuse in mind. The components of a, products, of a product need to be reusable. When you think about durable or technologi technological materials or products, they should stay in use as long as possible. We are convinced that the economy of the future will be more and more circular. It will be the new tomorrow. It will happen and companies have to adapt to it. But this, this swift will be gradual and it won't come for free. We need collaboration like this Zero Waste Scotland Forum. And we as a company are working together with our partners and customers to remove existing barriers to the effective implementation of a circular economy. If you look at the right-hand side of this chart, you see first of all the, the, let's say, forward logistics part. A product gets extracted or the traditional linear approach, it gets manufactured, it gets distributed to the customer and the customer uses it. In a closed loop system or in a circular system, for us as a logistics company, we defined three major reverse flows that are important for us. First of all, you have recycling. Then you have repair, and thirdly, remanufacture. I will now explain them a bit more because they are very important. Okay, here again you can see the three flows recycling, repair, remanufacture. For all these three flows, you need transport, you need warehousing, and you need, we call it value added services, so treatment of the product. To start with, recycling. For us, it means the process of collecting and treating used materials so that they can be returned in the production cycle. Recycling markets are often highly regulated. The recycling rates differ highly from country to country. It's very interesting to have a look at that. In some countries in Europe, um, the recycling rate is already around 60%. For example, in Austria, in Germany, also in Belgium. In the UK, it's around 40%. And there are also countries like Turkey, it's only 1%. What does it mean? I mean, on the one hand, there's still improvement potential in the system, and there's also opportunity for knowledge exchange there. To support recycling, you need convenient collection points for the, for the customer to enable people to recycle. For a logistics company, the value-added services required are often specific to the product category. For example, transporting, dismantling, and warehousing of e-waste, think about your old laptop or your old phone. It always involves handling of toxic and dangerous materials. Think about the, the battery, which is in the, in the product. 
This means the logistics solution has to comply with strict legislation. So for example, you have the ADR for the road, the EMDG for the sea transport, or the IATA for air transport. You often need special packaging, for example, transport boxes. They are very expensive. And warehousing solutions. And last but not least, your staff has to be trained. Then move on to the repair part. For us, repair means the restoration of a broken, damaged, or failed device or part. And the key factors here are, first of all, cultural differences. There are countries in which repairing is more established than in others. Secondly, the replacement costs. Repair only makes sense when for you as a consumer it's financially more viable to, to repair it instead of buying a new one, otherwise you won't do it. Then. Thirdly, the availability of replacement products. When the new product literally is just around the corner, then, or it can be easily ordered online, it won't encourage repair. And last but not least, the rate at which the product is evolving. Think about an iPhone. I think there's a new iPhone every year. So it also doesn't encourage the repair because products get outdated very soon. And repair markets are often local markets. So there's no sizable international flows for repairing purposes. And IT is becoming increasingly relevant, also due to data. Again, the example of your smartphone, when your screen is broken and you want to repair it, you have sensitive data on it. So you have to, your data needs to be um, protected, also in a repair system. <coughs> and then thirdly, the remanufacturing. This means returning a worn or damaged component or product to the same as new condition. From a financial perspective, this only makes sense, obviously, when the component or the residual value of the product, of the end-of-life product, is high enough. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. That's why it's primarily relevant for the B2B market. You need highly specific know-how and skills to remanufacture a product. An example of an established remanufacturing program is Caterpillar. You probably know this manufactory of heavy machines, trucks, and doses. And they have a system they call Cat Reman. And they claim to be the world leader in remanufacturing. So what they do is they dissemble an end-of-life product to the smallest part. The product gets cleaned, it gets inspected, and worn-out components are then converted into production-ready material once again. Logistic services are crucial for all three, and we at DHL want to be an enabler for it. And already today, as I said, we have implemented many reverse logistics projects in various industries. Okay, now after explaining where we come from and what circular means for us from a theoretical perspective, let's move on with some real life examples to make it a bit more tangible for you. Here you see an overview of selected circular projects within DHL. It's literally spread all over the world. This includes projects of the past and also ongoing projects. So this means we are not starting from zero, but there's also happening a lot or happened in the past. And the projects are covering a broad range of topics. So for instance, in the US, we run a retail scheme for recycling, repurposing, or disposal of products. We do this for a big retail chain. We sort the return goods and then decide on the product fate based on the agreement with our customer. This can mean that we resell the product, or that we recycle it, or that we donate it as well, or that the product gets disposed. Then also known examples are printer cartridges, here and there. So these are two examples in Chile and in Brazil. Then our collection and recycling of tires in India. We support a tire manufacturer in setting up a more circular system for their tires there. And you all know that used tires are a major waste issue. They end in landfill, people burn them, it's, it's really a mess. What we do is that we transport defect tires from the dealerships 
to, the, to a warehouse, then the tires gets inspected and it gets either used for further quality analysis by the manufacturer and tests in plant or the tires get scrapped to be used as road construction material. Then our circular asset management program. This is actually a project which is under development at the moment. And you might, well, it's clear that as a big company, we have literally thousands of old or unused IT and ICT equipment in our drawers and on our desks. And this project aims at extending the life cycle of the products and to increase the recovery and recycling at, of the product. The idea is to keep the used smartphones, laptop and other equipment in the loop or in the use as long as possible. So for example, when an employee leaves the company, the, the used products are collected, they get screened, they get cleaned, and also very important, the data gets wiped. And then if necessary, it gets refurbished and then goes to the next employee that the next one can use it again. So this is, as I said, it's under development. Then the collection of recycling of clothing, packaging actually. Um, we managed the collection and recycling of packaging waste for our major uh, clothing chain in Spain and Portugal. This includes the collection and recycling of cardboard, plastic and hangers. And then another example, our waste to energy. Um, it is the first international catering waste compliant biomass com combustion system in an airport. And it turns 2,200 tons of airline waste per year into energy. And this system actually saves 1,000 pounds per day in energy costs for our customer because it heats the, um, the buildings with it. And we are supporting our uh, customer to reach its recycling rate of 85% by 2020. Now I will give you some more detailed background information on actually four use cases. So the first one is our collection and maintenance for set-top boxes in Brazil. The second one is our electro return program in Germany. The third is our return and refurbishment of phones in Portugal and then our supply chain optimization for lithium ion batteries in Germany. Okay. First, our use case that we are running for a TV company in Brazil. How does it work? The company rents out set-top boxes, um, so it's, TV, it's a TV um, box, to their customers for the duration of the contract. At the end of the contract, the equipment goes back to the provider and here DHL comes into the play. What we do is that we transport and store the boxes, then we sort and test them. If necessary, we repair them, then they get a software upgrade, and then they go back to the next customer. We handle around 75,000 of these per month, actually. And this, the nice thing about it is that the process is, can be repeated up to eight iterations per product. So this means that the whole life cycle of the product is much longer. And thereby our customers also benefit from cost savings. The next one is electro return. This is a very established um, use case. It's, it has been running since over 10 years already in Germany and it's for end-of-life electronic devices. We ship over 150,000 pounds of old electronic devices per year through this, this system. And we cooperate with Alba, you probably know the company, it's one of the major European recycling companies. And how does it work? First, um, our, our customers can send in small electronic devices for free. It's actually free for the customer. So what, what has to be done? The customer prints out the, um, a label, puts it in an envelope and sends it either uh, through our um, mailboxes, we have 110,000 in Germany, or over the um, postal branch, we have 29,000 around Germany. And this whole service is free for the end consumer. For the business customers, we now also offer a possibility to ship bigger devices on our or in our network 
up to around 70 pounds. The background is that we have more and more um, requests by our customers uh, to comply with the new EPR legislation. Since October 2015, in Germany, I don't know how it is in other countries, but in Germany since then, big sellers of electronic devices, so big means more than 400 square meters of retail or shipping, shipment areas, are legally required to take back also large devices. So we use this service to enable our customers to comply with this new legislation. Next one is our return and refurbishment service in Portugal for used phones. It's for a telecom company. How does it work? We collect old phones from customer branches. We then screen the phones. We test them and give them, a, when it's necessary, a cosmetic overhaul. And after that, they go back to the customer for re reuse or resell. And we at DHL, we have the full end-to-end -end ownership of the repair process and it is integrated in our overall logistics process. We handle around 8,000 units per month for this customer. And then last but not least, I want to give you an overview on our battery use case and the changing automotive sector and its effects on logistics. As you all probably know is that the automotive industry is shifting from internal combustion engines to electric drivetrains. And lithium ion batteries are a key part for electric vehicle manufacturing, but at the same time a main cost driver for it. The lithium ion battery market comprises three different and highly interconnected customer segments. You have the cell and the battery producers, you have the EV manufacturers, so the electric vehicle manufacturers, and then at the end of the life cycle, the recyclers. Why is this relevant for us? We at DHL, we serve the supply chain of the major OEMs of the world, or well, OEM, original equipment manufacturer, so the car producers. We transport parts to the assembly line of them, we optimize their supply chain, we control the material inflow, and we are moving and managing the aftermarket parts, repair and maintenance operations. This means that the electrification of the industry also has a strong influence on us. I'm sure you all remember the Samsung Note story, right? This, did anyone own a, a Note 7 in the past? Well, okay, good that it's Samsung. the Samsung one, yeah. Um, so who wants a smartphone that's catching fire? Um, actually, on the, fla on the plane today, um, they also said, if you, if you have a, a device that's overheating, please talk to the, uh, to the crew. Um, and remember, a, a battery powering a car is way bigger than that of a smartphone. This means that it's also much more, more dangerous in case something goes wrong. A lithium-ion battery is a class 9 dangerous good. It contains lots of energy. It's very powerful. And when they catch fire, they can explode. It's so... We, you don't want it to have it on a plane, on a truck, or whatever. And this is especially um, relevant, but not only, but especially relevant for the handling of used batteries. And thus, it means for the reverse circular flow of a battery, this is highly impactful. And again, we are working together with our customers of these all three segments to meet their needs that are compliant um, and that are also compliant with dangerous goods requirements at the same time. And interestingly, finally, it's also internally for us at DHL important because with our street scooter, you might see it in the background, we are one of the European biggest producers of electric vehicles. We have around 5,500 of these cars on the road today. So the street scooter needs good batteries and also good repair and maintenance of batteries. So after this the strategic pos positioning of Circular in our company and a better understanding of the concept and a few use cases, the conclusions for, conclusion for us as a company is that we are committed to a shared value approach, creating value, as I said, for business and environment and society, 
And circular logistics is exactly one example of our shared value strategy. Circularity is a powerful global trend, but its implementation will be gradual. And the logistics industry is key to close this circle of a circular economy. And we are engaged with our customers and partners to develop circular solutions across the whole sectors. I do hope that I could bring this idea of circular a bit nearer to you. And um, I think there's a nice take home message for you is that circularity is really about rethinking and restructuring of the way we do business to move towards a sustainable future in which every business does or contributes their part. So many thanks for your attention. Um, I'm really interested in hearing what you think and learn what kind of circular solutions you might offer already have in your companies. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I have a few questions. Yeah, okay, I mean, then very, very far, far away, Thank you. Kevin, yeah. Um, the global perspective on it. Um, um, particularly your slide on um, all the circular business activity you're doing in different countries, how varied it is. Textiles, tires, ICT, electricals. Um, there's a few things you mentioned. You mentioned collaboration. Uh, assuming uh, you're doing it for a large retail customer in the US, you're doing a take back and refurbishment for, I assume, electrical and electronic equipment. And you spoke about uh, reuse and I assume getting value from reuse through resale. Mm -hmm. uh, you also spoke about recycling and you made the distinction on disposal. What did you mean by disposable versus reuse and recycling? Does that mean that you you can recycle it? Mm -hmm. Is that what disposal means? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a very interesting question. So you're touching the, let's say, the end of the life cycle of a product. and. Prior to this meeting today, we also had a discussion, what does it mean end of a life cycle of a product? Um, because you sh from a circular perspective, you should try to keep the products in the loop or in the use as long as possible. Yeah. And it's a question of definition, when is possible, when is the end of possible? Mm -hmm. So for example, for this use case of this incineration, it's a always a discussion, does it make sense or not? We believe that when you have um, category w one waste out of, a, of an airplane, so it's food waste and it's also plates, etc. Um, for us, it's the end of the life cycle, but maybe there's other views on that, but, uh, and we try to make as best use of this thing instead of putting it into landfill, we burn it and generate uh, so heat, right? So, but maybe there's, what, sh what should not happen is that uh, we, let's say, move up the recycling scheme or the, yeah, the, the okay. value mm -hmm. and then maybe burn stuff which is, could be used in other, other contexts, right. right? So this, is, this should not happen. Right. Okay. This I is important. I comment this week, wasn't there that the UK seemed to be making progress if you recycle it once, then after that it's maybe, you might say, disposed of, um, put energy to waste or into a landfill. But there's in Scandinavia they're sometimes recycled up to nine times. Mm -hmm. Now that to me comes down to cost and what's yeah. the cost benefit of it. Exactly. If you can't spend an awful lot of money trying to recycle something into is yeah. that an economic product? When you're looking into the, the, the circular idea, um, you should try to start with the designing process. Mm -hmm. So when you're thinking about a product, you start you should start about thinking at the beginning. So how could you I mean this is not circular at all, right? Um, you should try to think about the production design. So let's let's say uh, it's not, we take it for granted that it's not re reusable, okay? But you, sh you should, you could think about how is this, this material, how, how could you reuse it, right? Mm -hmm. And recycling or, yeah, so you should no, start I mean, early in the absolutely. process. Absolutely, and I wasn't picking on you, you know, I, I, I'm just, uh, it's an endorsement that it's really difficult to reuse Absol everything. Absolutely. And it's really difficult to recycle everything. And in some cases, there's a marginal amount you, you have to dispose of. 
and uh, I just wanted to make sure that DHL didn't have a secret solution <laughs> for 100% recycling or reuse. Yeah, the problem yeah. with recycling means also that um, from product to product, it's different what if you can reuse it or not. So, for example, if you you have a um, a cardboard box mm -hmm. and you want to recycle it. Uh, the the material loses its quality. So, yeah. for example, when the card cardboard gets wet, it's it's not that good anymore, even if you really treat it. Um, but when you're looking at a at a lithium ion battery, on the other hand, and you really burn it at the end of the life cycle, yeah. you get all the materials back, mm -hmm. and then you yeah. can reuse it. And mm -hmm. so, yeah. it's also different from the perspective of the product sure. itself. Okay. Uh, just one other question on on, on the same slide. Um, you, uh, you you focused on a, a number of different um, activities in countries. You kind of showcased uh, some uh, or shortlisted some particular activities, and you mentioned the collaboration with a company. Mm -hmm. is, is that standard for DHL to collaborate, or uh, clearly you've got an infrastructure that, that facilitates the full rever reverse logistic process already there? Uh, to get product back to a facility so you can reprocess it in a reverse way. Uh, so I just wondered, you know, how, how do you how do you approach um, working with others uh, versus doing it for yourself in different countries and with different materials? I think it has to happen both. So there are projects which we do on, as you said, on ourselves with our customers, and other projects where we need partners because we can't do it on ourselves. Sure. So both has to happen. Clearly to find markets exactly. and just with the resource associated with reprocess. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. One last question. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> just, that was the last one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just, uh, obviously the infrastructure you, you have uh, in transport, um, you know, planes, boats, um, automobiles, um, for the materials that you take back mm -hmm. to a facility in a for, you know, given country to, to, to reprocess, um, how much of those is that interest? This is probably a micro question. You might not know the answer to, but that's quite interesting. Not a micro question. How much? Um, how much of those vans are dedicated to solely that, mm. you know, function versus being a multifunction mm. activity yes, within the DHL? Yeah, uh, you you touch really a crucial point there because. Um, as every logistics company today, um, we are set up for uh, forward logistics, yeah. so bringing new products to the customer. And f to pick an example, so uh, in, in Germany and Europe, we do lots of, of e-commerce. So you order something on the internet and we bring it to your house. But we are at the moment not entirely prepared to take back, for example, your used cardboard boxes. Sure. There's no established process for that. And the operational process, it, it, is, it is highly, um, well, it's very, very complicated. It's not that the guy's just driving around and puts yeah. a parcel somewhere, yeah. but yeah. there's lots of pressure there. Mm -hmm. And you can't just actually throw used boxes in, in our van. It just doesn't Randomly, work. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. very complicated. And, and cardboard boxes are rather easy to use. If you start thinking about, as I said, uh, WE, so uh, waste electronics, then it gets very, very interesting mm -hmm. because you can't fill up like a truck with used battery products. It's it's very, very dangerous. So mm -hmm. it's complex. It's really complex. Can I ask a supplementary question around that? Because that was one of my questions as well. I was thinking, obviously, in terms of transport efficiency, ideally you'd be using, you know, backhauling mm -hmm. and for you know onward distribution and so on uh, techniques to maximize the utilization of the vehicle. But then you're mixing new product with waste product. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I wondered if you had come up with any uh, technical solutions to that, for example, in you know containment, uh, mm -hmm. uh, waste containers that might isolate su su you know, s sufficiently uh, to protect the new product from the, the waste mm -hmm. product. Uh, mm -hmm. Clearly, there's sorts of licensing as yeah. well in yeah. different countries associated mm -hmm. with the transport of the waste. That's, yeah. that's yeah. exactly this. in this direction it goes a bit, but it's not only this, it's also legislation. So mm -hmm. legally, you're also not allowed to put waste together with uh, new products in a van for example or you have to when it's when it's transporting waste you have to uh, use certain um, signs like this big uh, stuff on the outside of the truck yeah. and we don't want to have 
yeah, yeah. delivery van driving yeah. through the city and have this waste yeah, stuff on sure. it, right? So it's going cross bones on your yeah, delivery exactly, van. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's really complex this topic of uh, the combination of the forward and the return. I think it's really key to get yeah. get it to scale, you know, yeah. especially in the consumer sector. Yeah. yeah, and it's also like really a hand and egg problem. So. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, as a, as a logistics company, you have to invest in technology, in knowledge, in, in transport, uh, let's, as you said, also invest in the trucks to make them, mm -hmm. to make it happen, but at the same time you need certain demand for it, right? Yeah. That's what I mean by mm -hmm. hand and egg. It's, it's really expensive and mm -hmm. plus the legal part, you need certain papers, it's really complex. Mm -hmm. And when you start thinking about transporting stuff over or across border, yeah. Oh, it's horrible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's really, really yeah. horrible. Can I ask a supplementary question to that as yeah. well? So you've talked quite a lot about transporting waste and mixing with products, but are there any examples of materials that you're picking up where it's not designated as a waste? So it's a return, it's yeah. recognised as a, as a, as a, you know, still a product and it's going it's not back to use. It's, it's not so discarded. It's intended yeah. for reuse, yeah. But this is also a legal question. I know it is. It yeah. is, and uh, it is always a, um, a grey zone. Usually is it still a product, with a or is it already waste? Regulator, yeah. It's not easy. Okay, so you don't have any examples of not not where already. it isn't designated as waste, it's and it's still okay. Okay. And I think this is something that the. Um, sorry to uh, yeah. come back to you in a minute. I'll just just make a comment about what the European Commission is sort of grappling with because. There's two areas that are interrelated here that the Commission has realised are at odds with, e with each other. And one is the chemicals legislation, the REACH uh, legislation, which in, in one sense is trying to remove hazardous substances and, 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 and drive that continuously. Um, that has an impact on how you can use waste and, and recycle things because things are gradually being eliminated as hazardous substances. They're trying to resolve that um, issue, but there's a similar issue around uh, end of end of waste and, and, and when something is or isn't a waste. Mm -hmm. The circular economy, everybody understands the principles, but there are loads of barriers, both technical and legal, as, as mm -hmm. you've discussed. Exactly. And I think the Commission's trying to get the head round now how you kind of square the circle. Know, we still want the, legislation. The whole concept but is really, the whole circular economy concept is really meant to do without waste you know yeah. so you, you've designed waste out yeah. it doesn't occur mm -hmm. yeah. so you know it's a it, it is a bit of a dichotomy it, between them it is and how, how do you measure mm -hmm. circularity as well that's yeah. another discussion we've had in previous um, events actually but it's yeah. a, sorry but, come back to you. yeah but just one comment but the legal part why, why is it so complicated and i think from the from the past it made sense because the european union had have this strict uh, regulation to prevent that people just uh, take waste out of the country and dump it somewhere. Yeah. That's why it comes exactly. from and I think the legislation has to adapt to the future of a circular economy yeah. otherwise it's uh, uh, it's too complex. Yeah. 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 We have to change there. Yeah, so it would be a lot easier. Yeah, so yeah. I was going to try to pick up on the, on the question of the lithium ion batteries. You're, you're obviously going to have huge uh, numbers of these to, to transport around. Presumably you get the value or transporting them, but there must be an intrinsic value in them to process them at a later date. Is that, are you seeing a positive um, from doing that? Yeah, I mean, the, there's high value. So, for example, when you look into, um, let's pick the uh, electric vehicle market, um, there's a rule like 80% uh, capacity, it, that's the end of the life cycle for the usage in a car. That's around 200 kilometers or eight to or six to eight years. And then people try or will give them back. But still this battery, which had a value of 10,000 euro when it started, which is the, the average price of a battery to date to, to propel a car, um, I don't know how much the value will be, but when you start with 10,000 today, in six years there will still be value. But what you are not, well, probably won't do is just burn it because the value as you won't generate that much value, but what will happen is, or what the concept are at the moment is that you will reuse this battery, for example, as a buffer battery for your house, because you have uh, solar panels on the roof, but you will also want to use your, your heating or you want to have a warm shower also at night, so then you can use this battery as a buffer battery. Or what also concepts are in, on, on the islands is in the past, they always had this, this diesel generating systems, 
And now their idea is to really use 10, 20, whatever car batteries and bring them all together like in a block and use this as, a, as, a, as an electric um, buffer for the... So you're, talk, you're talking about somehow using the good cells that are, that are left in there for, for another purpose. Yeah. Um, when DHL looks at a group level on their operations and from what, what we saw on the, the graphic, was it with, you know, North America, South America, Europe, out into the, the east? Um, you must see a, a, quite a large divergence in the way that regulation is either created in the first place or applied. Um, and that's why I quite like, you know, taking us back to the UK probably almost 20 years ago. And the, where we sat under United Nations, the EU, and then the UK government, the Scottish government, the local authorities, when you got down to doing things in Scotland, in the areas of Scotland, there was a whole aligned uh, structure, you might say legal requirements, um, but the great thing about legal requirements is they give you definitions, and then when you get people who are used to working within that, they can say whether it's a, an end of life product, whether it is a waste product, when it's a waste product, we all know it kicks you into the Environmental Agency or, or the Scottish Environmental Protection Agency, and that takes up cost of production, uh, protocols, environmental management systems, and that becomes a whole industry in itself. Um, and so I was just wondering from the DHL group level, because you're operating hopefully with a, a standardised product, but for the local markets, you'll see that the, the local markets operate quite differently. Um. Yeah, as you said, there are highly differences around the world. And um, to be honest, we don't have a standardized um, product portfolio today. Yeah. But this should happen, right? Um, the beauty of it on the other side is that we have uh, really good people locally around the world who are very interested in this in these topics. And well, they have been brought to yeah. DHL HQ. Because one thing looking from the mm -hmm. UK to Germany in terms of the renewable energy, when we saw what was done with with solar, biogas, wind, uh, I think you were probably at least 10 years ahead of us in your development of, of, of those markets. Um, but when you bring it to a sophisticated country that's well educated with a very receptive population, mm -hmm. as I would say, mm -hmm. um, and then you put people, those people have come there trained and seen the way, not, not quite the way, the truth, the light, here's a way to do it, and you put <coughs> it back into the local situations, mm -hmm. that's not necessarily the way that's taken it. Because I, I hear stories, I read stories of that's okay for you, I .e. Western Europe, North America. You've had 200 years of polluting the world to get to this stage of refinement. We've not had that, so we'll continue to do what we do, but it's the same sea that swirl around, it's the same, mm -hmm. the same wind that goes all the way around. But it's just because we are lucky enough to have you as a, a representative of a global company, how you see that, because I've always thought we in Scotland would have the opportunity to go and assist others. Mm -hmm. But that, that in a long way depends upon the willingness of the people that you're going to see to engage in that. And I've seen a lot of people, and a lot of companies in Scotland say, can't afford to do that, just, just dispose of it, let somebody else do it. Yeah, I mean, what we, as, as I said for we are a division of different companies, and these companies, each of them is strong. And what we in the headquarters don't do is just give rules out of the, on the world how to do it, right? What we do is um, we look into these examples and we try to extract the learnings of it. And as I also said, we try to disseminate the, this knowledge around the world and to improve it. But we don't give strict rules out of the, the headquarters. But you have to ensure that there's learnings. Could I ask a question about um, motivation of, of customers? Um, so to what extent would you say that customers are generally motivated by the financial benefits of reverse logistics and of, of those, you know, are they all seeing um, a very strong financial benefit from taking a reverse logistics approach, a more circular approach, or is it partly motivated just by reputation and corporate targets and so on? Um, it's different from um, sector to sector. Hmm and also from company to company. So um, I think already today there are companies who are really into getting their products back at the end of the life cycle, not because of a CSR approach, but because they really need them. Yeah. So for example, when you look into a chip producer, 
they have really sensitive uh, materials in it and um, they have high um, shifts of prices yeah. when they and then they need certain products to, to produce yeah. that, this chip right and um, when they just take a um, um, end of life cycle product just somewhere out of a whatever they don't know what is exactly inside it but if they get their own products back yeah. in, a, in a closed system they know exactly what it what's inside then they melt it down and reuse it and so and in other parts it's not that we are not there yet but I would say in the in the tech sector that's the leading one at the moment yeah so it's about security of supply and yeah. predictability of yeah and hatching your costs and, and it's yeah. really a cost factor yeah it gives you that predictability exactly. going forward yep. uh, on critical raw materials yep. in, in particular. Yep. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, I think there was, were you, did you have yeah, another question? Yeah, I was going to ask yeah. about your, your set-top box um, analogy. Well, um, when, when these come back, are they getting recycled back into um, remanufactured units? What, what, what are you doing with them? So, um, we don't recycle them at the beginning, but we take them back. Um, we give them an overhaul, that means just from the outside, they get cleaned, um, they get, when it's necessary, they get repaired, they get a new chip or whatever. But the idea is to make this process as lean as possible and to really reuse it, as I said, up to eight times. Wow. So the recycling is really at the end of the, let's yes. say, at so, so, so the person that gets that next knows that they have, they're going to get reused. Yeah, I mean, it can also mean that you just put a, a, a new exterior on the on the product, but the uh -huh. inside stays stays the same. And I think it's also f for routers, right? You you uh, your internet router for your home. I mean, you don't care how <coughs> if it's you reused or what, but you just have it for two years and then you give it back. So so the customer doesn't know necessarily well, that it's a reuse. Yeah, box. I mean, but it's just the customer doesn't buy it. It's yeah, it just gets just it for free for the year of, or for the two yeah. years of. of so yeah. I guess as long as it looks in exactly. good condition, they exactly. don't care. Exactly. It does the job. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I think this is a niche of product It's that's different from a smartphone. Yeah. Because you want, I mean, there's also people who uh, have a remanufactured smartphone, so Apple has like a system to do that. Mm -hmm. But I think that's a more sensitive thing because you have it in your hand all day and it's... Um, People have affections for that, right? Um, but uh, a router or um, like a set-top box, it's yeah. a different story. I'm fond of mine, though. I like mine. <laughs> set-top boxes. That's great. Yeah, I, mean, okay. yeah I, I don't take it around with me, no. I don't, I don't take it on holiday. Um, Can I ask the question, is this a partner of DHL that's doing this for you in Brazil, or is it DHL itself? It's we do it ourselves. It's yourself. Yeah, yeah. So this is an increasing area of business for you to develop. In, interestingly, DHL is doing a lot more than just transporting. Mm -hmm. Before I joined the company, I also didn't know that. But, but also in the forward or in the mm -hmm. forward logistics part, for um, an OEM, we also do parts of car dis um, um, production, and mm -hmm. we really deliver the really end or yeah. usable. A dashboard, not only the part, but a really set up dashboard into the car manufacturing lane, and it's yeah, that's that's really happening a lot. I don't know everything, but that's quite that's quite interesting because that very point is when I walked into the room, I didn't know realize that you're doing all of the, mm -hmm. the stuff you're doing. So how can you market that information to actually get it out to the public domain? that you are actually doing all of these other things other than the DHL uh, flights and trucks and stuff, etc. Because that could also change the mind exactly. and the perception of other organizations. Yeah, that's a good point because um, yeah, I think you have to understand how the, um, the commercial process work. So when you look at any kind of country and there's a DHL local team and they have customers and the customer asks for a solution. And then we try to find a, a solution together with the customer. And in the past, it was always forward logistics, but now we have the change in, in the direction of reverse logistics. And the knowledge which is generated in, in certain areas of the world, it has to be brought on a higher level. And this is exactly your point. But we are not there or, uh, yet. Mm. But I think that's the next it's step. Journey. It's a journey, definitely mm. is. Because it's way more complex than doing forward logistics. Could I ask a question about the technology and the way that technology is changing and enabling all of this? It seems that, you know, more and more we hear about uh, the Internet of Things and blockchain 
technology and the ability to track you know individual items much more precisely we can track the condition even of of individual products potentially mm -hmm. and through condition monitoring and telemetry systems and all sorts of, of, of uh, technology which is getting cheaper and cheaper uh, and easier to to uh, deploy I'm just wondering how that is affecting all of this and how you see that helping enabling all of this in the future well it helps a lot it will help a lot because when you want to reuse a product you have to know what it's in, what's inside so for example when you look into the build build industry and you disassemble a house after 20 years of of, of use today we don't know what's in the walls That's if right. and uh, when you know this in the future and you just have a what kind of device, whatever, before you dismantle the house, you just have a check around what's, what's in, the, in the mirrors of the etc. Mm. It makes it way cheaper to dismantle the house, but also to reuse the materials. Mm. Because what happens today, they just, yeah, just break it down and then it's, it's the, the value gets lost. Precisely. That's the future, but... Yeah, Not quite there yet. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, people talk about product passports and, exactly. and having all the data in a QR code yep. or whatever it is, yep. to, to, or an RF chip, yep. that would really help you to understand exactly what has the substances are there, whether you can or can't reuse certain components, yep. the condition of those and so on. Yep. Uh, so it's, yeah, yeah it's but again, the question, what is the value of the product? Because tracking is, is expensive, mm -hmm. and you need, again, a, a, like a residual value of the product. So for example, for a chip producer, maybe, a tracking makes sense because the value of the product is is, is yeah. high. But when you're looking in a card at a cardboard yeah. box, yeah, sure, yeah. Although interestingly, it seems like the sensors and the the tracking devices are getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, such that you can now start to use them on, on yeah. much lower value. Yeah, that's true. Items. Yeah. Um, I was looking to uh, logistics. So I was going to say, how about yeah. logistics about taking products, which maybe you're talking about. Uh, a house but in this country we tend to demolish them rather than take them apart and reuse the part and then recovering waste wood and taking recovered waste wood when you want to use that as a feedstock for the next process you have to have specification has it been treated has it been painted how do you deal with that then of course if you're buying technology <coughs> a specialist that needs a specialist feedstock that comes with a very tight specification of what goes into it so you then have to put that into the, the supply chain the supply chain may not be that sophisticated and then you've got to put the costs on to them to give you the product that you might be prepared to pay for, but otherwise they're trying to dispose of. And I discovered that there's a, a line saying there's no such thing as waste, there's just a co-product. Yeah. Uh, and that co-product becomes someone else's input. But when you do that, uh, you need, you know, if you get if you bought, if you raise your money for the project over say 10 years or proportion of it on a debt rather than an equity basis, you've got to pay that down. And so the people who provide that money want to see 10 year visibility minimum. Uh, with a 20 year usability so that they know that if there's an underperformance mm -hmm. with you using your recycle it and that's where the whole process you've got to have it from start yeah. to finish so that you, you know you can sell your output and that's got to come from the visibility of it then you get into the covenant of the supplier how strong are they what happens if they go bust are you going to left with a, a dry asset that would use that that input so I, I understand what you're saying, it's a complex business, and that's why DHL may look at its risk profile and what it does, but it ain't going to build plants to process things unless they've got a sure supply yeah. of what comes in and where exactly. it goes afterwards. Exactly. This lady. Yep. I, I think the struggle at the moment, I've not been to any of these sessions before, so this question's probably come up in the past, but I think the struggle with the commercial reality of the sort of products that we have. So we manufacture stair lifts, which are quite expensive, very um, heavily engineered products, electric motors, castings, electronics, you know, there's everything in there. And, you know, not want to disclose detailed costing, but if you typically say that at the end of the life cycle, which is usually very short in our industry because it's a lot of elderly people, we will put a product out there and typically get them back within a very short period of time, hardly used, uh, back to the factory. And you know, looking at that product coming back, we're we're just stockpiling them at the moment, thinking right, we we really just want to stop dismantling these and put them into the proper recycle bins because the value of the parts is quite significant. 
hardly used and it's touching on the warranty type of side and the, mm -hmm. the great areas of remanufacturing versus mm -hmm. second hand goods kind of thing. So we're kind of struggling with the, the whole commercial concept that if I am selling a stair lift to someone, that's direct revenue for a brand new stair lift. If I sell that as a, a refurbished product, you're you're kind of cutting your own revenue chain in a certain way because you're yeah. you're kind of selling it to the same user for a much lesser price. I think um, yeah, that's the, you're touching exactly the commercial part of it. I think, but this is this is more of a of a of a management or a marketing perspective. You have to um, differentiate your new product yes. and you remanufacture it, and you should try to. Um, to go to a different customer with your remanufactured one. So, for example, if your new product is cost thousand and your remanufactured cost two hundred, mm -hmm. then probably you get, you pay you 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 sell this remanufactured one to a different kind of customer. So I I don't think that you you. We, we kind of are looking at that, but I think I think we're coming down down to the fact that to stop cutting our own throat, if you like, from from new new business and new sales, it's almost like we're. We're more kind of looking at upcycling what the bits are back into a different yeah. product that doesn't affect our market. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, it's how you position it on that market exactly. as well, though. You know, do, yeah. do you actually have to tell customers that it's a remanufactured product? Precisely. Yeah. That's if you've if yeah. you've what if you've mm -hmm. tested it and it's it f it performs you know the same as a new product. And it does get you down to that whole the components within here. Yeah. Some of the components will withstand twenty five year life cycle. Do you, but not, do you not just see this as a as a supply of cheap components? Because oh, yeah. if you were if you were buying, <laughs> no, if you were buying them yeah, from third right. parties, you pay full market price. You sold them to your customer at yeah. full market price. You then get them back because that customer's no longer with yes. it, yeah. having it enjoyed your mm. your product. Well, so I mean, then you've got those products. You're not going back to your original supplier. So you've got them bought and paid for by you well and by your customers, the, then put them back in. This is kind of the, yeah. the sort of, we, we're looking at several business plans at the moment to see what are we going to do. Um, and one of them, one of them would be exactly that, which is let's say you've got 50% of the value that can be dismantled very easily and reused in the, the main production line. Yeah, exactly. Um, but then you get into that legal gray area of, uh, so you would have to market it to say, you know, we've almost kind of thought, well, Let's for two days of the month set the line up that we know that those products have got um, remanufactured parts or components, you know, recycled but components, and market it like no, but an it environment. Still be the same. But no, but you don't. Be the BS yeah. standard. All the standards will be the same. It would, it's not being diminished yeah. by use. Yeah, you, you don't. I don't. Yeah. You don't sell it as a. What as what a what product do you sell? It's um lifts. Yeah. For, for, for elderly people. Ah, okay, people. okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because. Um, Maybe you should think about going the next step. So, what is your business model? Uh, have you heard about this this Philips thing? So, what they did in the past, well, they do it again uh, also today. Is they, when you look at lighting, so they they sold uh, light bulbs pa here. Paper looks. Yeah. What yeah. they do now is they move into the direction of selling light, light hours. So, for example, for this university or this university could buy from Philips. We want, I don't know how many hours of light a year, instead of we buy 10,000 of these bulbs. And this is a different business model. And in, when you think about this one, um, this university doesn't care if this bulb is remanufactured or not. They just care about the light. And so maybe you should also could think about a different business model for you. But I don't want to... I don't know. I think because Dirk's been on quite a lot. He said much. And I think everything seems to be coming out of this because of this great area of remanufacturing, put components in, if you turn it into a, almost a leasing type thing, yep. yeah, yeah. which doesn't really commercially sit very well with me, I'll be honest. Or a paper lift because up the stairs, you know, you know how, many, how many lifts up the stairs yeah, do you get yeah. and you pay for each one of them. But <laughs> how that would pan out, I don't know. Yeah. To emerging markets. Yeah. Um, the beauty of this concept mm. is that you keep um, ownership of the product. <laughs> um, it's, well, it yeah. depends on the, on the market, right? But um, you know where your product is, you know how the customer uses it, uh, you, you learn way more than in just selling the product and never see it again. Mm -hmm. 
I think you're I've, in a you're in a perfect position. I think to yes, to do exactly what we're talking about because when you look at remanufacturing and the cost benefits of it, generally speaking, people aren't doing what you you said about producing a kind of refurbished product and selling that and undercutting their own new product. If you look at what Xerox did originally, you know they, they weren't putting refurbished copiers onto the market. The mainstream copiers had refurbished components in them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you don't have to lease them if you, you don't want to go down that road. I mean, it's one option, I think, one model. But um, a lot of these companies are... It, it's all about the testing, isn't it, of the component. Yeah. If you can recertify the component or sub-assemblies to the same standard as new, and yeah. sometimes they're certified to a higher standard than some of the original components, actually, in these products. I from what I mm. gather. I mean, I think if, if you look at any of the legalities, I've kind of touched on it from a legal viewpoint, and and you get the whole lawyer speak, sorry if there's any lawyers in there, mm -hmm. that's, you know, sorry. It's like, yeah. <laughs> well, that's why, that's why yeah, yeah. you go around it. Yeah, but there are businesses doing that, yeah, doing precisely. that sort of yeah, model, yeah. so it would be worth yeah. investigating that a bit, yeah. a bit further. Yeah. And, and that, yeah. generally, when you talk about the cost benefits of remanufacturing, it is just what you said. It, it's, you're getting back known you know, they're your products, you understand them, and you've got a cheaper component. I mean, I mean, um, you sell a, an operation and maintenance package with your... You do, yeah. So therefore, if you've got a maintenance package, you'll think, well, I've just spent this amount for yeah. this piece of equipment. If I'm going to be transported up from a, a lower level to a higher level, I don't want it to fail. Mm -hmm. So the, the driver's on for me to get the maintenance it's, package. It's, so therefore, your maintenance people are motivated to ensure that that product works. Long yeah. state, all the period of time, not necessarily replacing things before the due, but there will be a maintenance program. I, I think another part of this is. Having that record, as you say, if you've got a service record, because your people are doing the servicing, you have the service record, so you understand the history of the product. But also, uh, I think in the future, I mean, this happens a lot. Um, condition, you know, condition monitoring of, of components, you can uh, you can do that increasingly, uh, and you know that's you know Rolls Royce. I know this is a, a different um, <laughs> level of, of product, but Rolls Royce, you know, are monitoring every single thing on an engine all the time in the air through telemetry, understand exactly what's happening. But, you know, I think the future will just have that data yeah. uh, available. The thing for us, we, we, we don't, as a business, uh, actively <coughs> sell your steer, like you don't actively want to actually buy that back from you or even get involved in it because it involves another layer of activity. So there's a whole second-hand market out there that's attacking our business exactly. with, our, with our own yeah, product. Yeah. So, yes. you know, it makes sense for us to, to encourage our customers to bring everything back to yeah. us. Yeah. But we're at that point where you know the, the walls are going to cave in on us. If we, if we you're not. You're not from Stannard. No. Uh, no. Um, no. Yeah. Because you know there there are other companies that are obviously understanding the same problem. You know, I always think with circular economy, what what people are realizing with a heavily engineered product like like yours is that by letting the second hand market deal with it, mm. you're you're putting a huge amount of effort Absolutely. into producing a highly engineered quality product. That only has a very short life because, as you say, the owners often have short life. Um, but you know, and then you let somebody else get the value of your engineering. Yeah. Why, why let somebody else get the value of it? Yeah. Take that value back in in, in house. But it, it would be ideal if I could sit here tonight and say, yes, what I can do is bring those products back and break them down and recoup the. Why don't you write into your sale contract that there'll be a buyback option for you, something no, no, to be with the and then you buy it back yeah, at a fraction of the price that someone's paid? But what example. I need to work it's out is the legality of can I, can I um, legally and, and engineering wise, yeah. which we can, we can certify you know, most of the parts to say, yeah, these have been tested to 25 years. Yes, this steer lift yeah. has only been in action for six months. But just so do that and get yourself an insurance policy. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure I mean, there's I'm sure there's <laughs> some options, yeah. Yeah. And and it's worth saying to everybody actually in case you haven't heard this before, but you know, Zero Way Scotland has um a lot of well, so, yeah, one to one business support, business support service, uh, under circular so economy to help. Yeah. If you're an SME, we yeah. can certainly we're, we're actually, we're, 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 we're talk. Yeah. Yeah. Great, well, that's good. Can I ask yeah. another question, Maureen? Yeah, of course. Okay. On your Electro Return Germany project, mm -hmm. have, has that also considered getting devices like uh, desktop computers, laptops? And what sort of reuse level do you get from it at the moment? That's a question. Are you looking at the end customer or the business customer? So for the end customer, it's only smartphones, um, small electronic devices. 
it's not your water cooker or because uh, not, laptops. not laptops they're too big right. because you can't just send them in in an envelope ah, so, okay. <laughs> that's that's the, so the you know, issue okay. at the moment you'll pack them up yeah, yeah. So are you looking at picking up collections? picking up means again as we have already uh, talked uh, about is how do you equip your van when you think mm -hmm. about picking up i think uh, in the Netherlands, the Dutch and Al Post, they do a project where they pick up uh, used electronics. I don't know the, exa um, the results out of this pilot, but it's, I think it happened or it's happening at the moment. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how, how it works there. So but providing yeah. dedicated vehicles to collect in households. Yeah, so, so they're coming to the household and pick up <coughs> the stuff. You've considered that the discounted it from now? We are not there yet. Okay. I don't know. Okay. It's, it's, it's also the question who drives it. So um, is it the, the community, so the local community who's interested in getting back this, this, this component or is it a company behind it? It's, at the end, it's always the question, what is the motivation? Yes. Is, it, is it the end customer who wants to pay for it? I don't know. Is it convenience? What was your motivation for the Brazilian project? To become the company actually doing the reprocessing, remanufacturing, blending <coughs> of intelligence? Um, well, it's really a business model. What led to it? So well, it's you, how did a logistics company move into television rather than choosing a partner? Well, it's, yeah. well, it's, it's mm -hmm. together with the partners, so the, the TV company, they are interested in this, this model to, to reuse this, uh, this, um, this boxes because uh, we had this minutes ago it's uh, it's not about selling the box to the end customer because it would be too expensive and the customers are not interested in buying it for two years and then the, the value is basically zero what do you do with the set top box but you don't have a contract anymore what do you do with it sell it via eBay but I don't know how much money you get for it so there's no market for it so people are used to rent them f just for the period of time so our customer was looking for a partner to make this this circular system work, and we help them to do that. And, and is the project of Brazil being delivered with that customer? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I see. Well, it doesn't make sense for us alone because yeah, sure. we need the input of the product, sure. and we are not a TV company. Who, who is that? I'm curious. Uh, well, I can't give you the name. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Sorry. I was just interested what the, the kind of split with your business, I mean you've said obviously the forward business was, mm, yeah. was you know, where you were, um, where, we you are. What's, where you are, what mm -hmm. sort of demand are you getting for reverse logistics, is it something that you're outwardly trying to convince you know, your customers to do and to consider or are you, are you getting a lot of um, requests to yeah, what what provide that, yeah, yeah what sort staffs, of, yeah. and is it increasing I it's, it, it is increasing, yeah, yeah, and um, as I already, we talked about the tech sector and especially there yeah. you have more and more demand of companies okay. who want to g get their products back. So they're approaching you yeah, yeah. directly? Yeah, they are uh, our customers yeah. and they ask us for a reverse solution and then we have to offer it. Yeah. It's yeah. a business need to do that, okay. but I can't give you a percentage if it's, uh, yeah. oh, Sorry, top we, secret. Yeah. No, no, we don't have it. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I don't know if it's ninety-nine percent. If it's fifty, 50 no, it won't be fifty-fifty. Uh, Are you getting much demand in the UK? Yeah, yeah. Okay. We do. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah. 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 I guess um, we, yes, we have probably, kind of run out of time really out of for Q and A, yes. and there's refreshments uh, of an alcoholic nature out there if you want them. Um, so. Yeah, really just to, to thank you very much, Marin, for coming and giving us a, a really interesting talk. I think the, the level of the questions and some of the discussion we've had is kind of reflective of, you know, the interest in the room, even though we're small in number. Precisely, um, yeah. That's so thank you very much. Yeah. And uh, are you around for yeah, the next half hour? Yeah. So if there's other questions you want to, to put to you, I think it'll be here. So thank you very much. Right.